Corruption, but I'm Pablo Torre. And with Wilbon off today, Tony, I just want to thank you for reaching out. I didn't reach out. Did you reach out? Who reached out? Who are you talking to? That Nigel to back see there? You. Did anyone yeah, reach out? Did I just show up randomly here? Is that how you booked We're this so show? Happy the greatest have you. show in the history of sports television? Just wandering through. This is through. how we begin right. all the time. Make you feel like you're not really welcome, but you are yeah. welcome. You know you're welcome. And everybody out there, welcome to PTI, boys and girls. Wilbon is getting fitted for the Bears mascot costume. I am pleased to be joined by our great friend from the Murrow Award-winning podcast, ESPN Daily, Mr. Pablo Torre. <laughs> Journalism. That's why I'm here, the journalism. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. I hope you get shop credit or glassware or gummy bears. We begin today college credit. with a spotlight on Dan Snyder, the embattled owner of the Washington football team. Last week, the Washington Post and today ESPN have published stories indicating Snyder's tenure as an NFL owner is in jeopardy. Now it turns out multiple owners and team and league sources tell ESPN they've been told Snyder hired private investigators to gather dirt on fellow owners and the commissioner. Pablo, what questions does this raise in your mind? Well, the first one, Tony, of course, is, is he bluffing or not, right? This is a story now about palace intrigue. There are serious dimensions to this story, of course, investigations into cultures of misconduct, settlements and all of that. But we're talking about the palace intrigue because Dan Snyder right now, feels cornered. He feels alone. He has lost Jerry Jones, reportedly, as his ally, his biggest ally in the NFL. And so they want him to sell. Roger Goodell reportedly wants him to sell. And the question is, if you're Dan Snyder, how do you keep your team? And so far, the answer that we've heard, Tony, is that he needs to build a new stadium because this is a story also about money and the money he is costing his fellow owners by not being better at running the business of the Washington Commanders. Okay, so I'm gonna just go slowly because I'm used to this because of where I live. You First are. First of all, let me say for the record that the Washington football team denies all accusations and all allegations. And if you live mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. like I do, you know this is a repetitive pattern over the last few years. If you live in Washington, D.C., again, you've heard all these things. They are in the air all the time, the accusations, the allegations, in the air like fog. Every day goes by, it's there. I'm not here to defend Dan Snyder as an owner on, on any level. I do think one of the ways you can judge an owner is by the product that he puts on the field. He's been the owner for nearly 25 years. They've won two, count them, two playoff games. They've never been in the NFC Championship game. And they were one of the most vibrant money-making franchises in the history of the league, and they are irrelevant now. I will speak to the notion of him hiring private investigators. Yeah. I believe that. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Because they're coming after him, and I don't think he wants to have nothing in his back pocket except a handkerchief. Okay? Dan Snyder does not want to sell this team. His entire identity is wrapped up in owning this team. He is yes. a desperate man at the moment to own this team because he doesn't want to be, Pablo, just another insecure rich guy. He <laughs> wants to own this particular team, and that's what this is about. So, so he is, I think, perfectly willing to go down the road of mutually assured destruction. And, and Tony, as, as some attempt at detente here goes, right? I mean, this is how he achieves it. He scares people into thinking that we can't press the red button because he's going to press the red button on us. I understand that. But I want to say here is that there are also stories in this reporting about him hiring private investigators that are interfering with the investigation into this culture of misconduct. Don Van Etta told me on ESPN Daily today that the thing that bothers owners the most, though, is not any of the stuff that's serious about culture, morality, stadium. ethics, culture, any the of that. Stadium. It's the stadium. stadium. They, they have been, Tony, Money. as you well know, okay. they have squandered a market. Do we do this in Maryland, Virginia, D.C.? He has failed at building this. He has failed at so getting the get golden ticket. And, right. and now, Tony, right. this is to what's that. so embarrassing. Yes. There's no enthusiasm at the moment in Maryland, in Virginia, in the District of Columbia, all three of which would have competed happily and to the death 20 years ago to get a stadium mm -hmm. built. If politicians find him toxic, 
He will not get the stadium built. And that appears to be the avenue to get him out of the league. But right. I've heard this for a while, Pablo. I'm not <laughs> betting on it. Not betting on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have missiles pointing in all directions for years, it seems like. But this is the backdrop, Tony. The mutually assured destruction is the backdrop against which the commanders take the field against the Bears tonight in Chicago. There's an actual game here. Earlier this week, Ron Rivera, the coach, you'll recall, he walked back comments that did sound like he was longing for a quality quarterback that he does not currently believe he has in Carson Wentz. And his commanders are one in four. And the whole state of the team, the state of the franchise, and also given how beatable the Bears seem to be, all of this makes me wonder, how significant is this for, for Washington, this game? <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't really think it's all that significant. Whoever wins this game is going to be 2-4. and four. They're going to have 11 <laughs> more games than they're likely to lose 7 or 8 of them. You know, I mean, I just, you know, let's, let's look at this team for a second. That's why I take notes. You know, at, at this point... This is a terrible game. And the only reason these two teams are in prime time is because everybody has to play in a Thursday game. Unless someone stood up in a boardroom and said, what's the worst game we can put out there for the United <laughs> States to see? And then it would be this game. I'm going to watch a little of it because I like Al Michaels so much personally. I called Wilbon. He doesn't think he's going to watch. He's not wow. going to watch a Bears game. All right. So let me, get to, let me get to the inherent drama with Carson Wentz and, and flesh this out just a little bit. I think it's very possible Carson Wentz, by the end of the season, will lead the league in passing yards. His team will win four games because at every critical juncture of the game, he throws an interception. I mean, that's what he's done. Ron Rivera basically said that. Ron Rivera said something like, the reason we're at the bottom of our division is because the other teams have quarterbacks <laughs> better than our quarterback. So I don't know how you walk something like that back. It was suggested to me earlier this morning that if you think Draymond Green and Jordan Poole don't like each other, get in the quarterback room with Carson Wentz and Ron <laughs> Rivera sometime. Especially when the other quarterbacks in this division, Tony, are Cooper Rush and Daniel Jones, and yet Dalen Hurts is yeah. actually good. But this is this is indictment by by actually strong insult as opposed to faint praise, I suppose. So look, the thing about Carson Wentz and Ron Rivera right now, and this came up in the story we talked about with Don Van Nat and Seth Wickersham and and and, and uh, Tisha Thompson, right? This was Dan Snyder's call. He believed that one thing that could save him would be a marquee quarterback. And we have owners also laughing at the idea that Carson Wentz would be that guy. But the Carson Wentz question to me is a settled one, right? I mean, you're right. This is a game in which not just you, but me and Wilbon and all of America will be falling asleep to by halftime. That's the reality yeah. of where we're going to be tonight. Yeah. I sat here yesterday and I picked Clayton Kershaw over you, Darvish. Wilbon went the other way. It turns out they both underperformed. They both gave up three earned in five innings in the game, went to the bullpens where the Padres were better. The series is now even. Pablo, do you now think of this series as a toss-up? Oh, it, we have to. Tony, this is a best of three. First to two, two wins, wins the series scenario. And this is an 111-win Dodger team against an 89-win Padre team. If the Padres win, this would be the second biggest upset by win percentage in baseball history. And yet, here we are, because the Padres have a lineup. They have Machado, they have Soto, they have the bats, Tony. And so, absolutely, the Dodgers are in trouble. Yeah, so I still think the Dodgers are the better team. Um, I would point out that they had beaten San Diego in L.A. going into last night's game, 15 of the last 17. That, that's, that's a lot. The Padres had never won a single playoff game from the Dodgers ever. So what happened last night sort of rocks my world because I look at the Dodgers as not just the better team. I think the Dodgers are the best team in baseball and have sure. been for four or five years. And now I'm tremendously apprehensive that they will lose this series and not even get to the World Series. And this is what happened last year. You gave that 89 stat. Last year after beating the Giants, the Dodgers at 106, the Giants at 107. They knocked out the Giants. They lost to the Braves who'd won 88. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at a team that I want to call a dynasty. They only have one World Series. And Wilbon would say they're a dynasty of one. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> so I'm shutting up. <laughs> no, but we have. But again, another story we've seen that you've seen years and years now, right? Baseball is an ultra marathon followed by a hundred meter dash. 
Of course, the Dodgers are the best well, team. The sample size is so large. But here we are flipping coins again. And here we are having talked about should the Mets go DeGrom and Scherzer or save one of them to face the Dodgers the next series. Well, guess what's going to happen now? Maybe. Nobody's going to be there in the end by the time we get to the World Series. No, I, you know, I, I understand this. What happens is in a short series, pitching is the hot goalie. You have to have pitching. Yep. The Dodgers don't seem to have a bullpen. So if what happened last night happens again where the starters draw and it goes to the bullpen, then the Dodgers are in trouble. But I sit here, Pablo, still saying that I think they're the better team. Let's take a break. Coming up, Zion leaves a preseason game with left ankle soreness. What's the word for that? And what's the best way to describe this video of Russell Westbrook just not joining the Lakers huddle? This makes me very happy, that video. I, it just makes me happy. <laughs> I watched it. Pardon the interruption is presented by Interruption. Brought to you by Twisted Tea. Part of Happy Hour. Time for What's the Word, where I'm known as the Chuck Norris of the thesaurus. It's hard to say, but it's true. What's first? The appropriate reaction to Zion's left ankle tweak is blank. My word is Edvard Munch. I want you to stay with me on this, Pablo. <laughs> Edvard Munch is or was a great Norwegian painter, most famous for a painting called The Scream, which looks like this. That is How many accurate. times are we going to sit here and are we going to talk about Zion Williamson and some other injury? Either his shoe blows out or he breaks his foot or he rolls his ankle. Look, he's a potentially, potentially great player. But what happens is he jumps and he lands because he's so big and strong with such force that traditional bones and ligaments and cartilage can't withstand the force of that. And so we do this all the time. So when he gets on the court, that's great. But every few games, it's... That's right. That's it. But, this, but this is why my word is Van Gogh. We should all feel Van Gogh about this, Tony, to stay in the art history tradition because it makes me want to cut my ear off, okay? I'm with you. <laughs> this is all wildly frustrating. This is a story that I feel like I've been haunted by for years. And the reality is, and you said the phrase traditional cartilage, which I think applies to this story too. You're right. It's a physics problem, right? It's a physics problem with him. And the good news was he is leaner. He is stronger. He's looking better than he has. The good news also is that he's 22 years old. But this feels like a story, Tony that we're just going to keep on rehashing because, of course, there are going to be more problems. We're in the rinse cycle with this guy <laughs> all the time. Can't believe I go good. Edward Munch. He goes one up on me, goes Van Gogh. What's next? Fine arts. Russell Westbrook not joining Pat Bev's Lakers huddle last night looks blank. It looks savvy. Why should Russell Westbrook Kneel at the feet of Patrick <laughs> Beverly. Russell Westbrook is 10 times the player that Patrick Beverly is. Who died and said that Patrick <laughs> Beverly was the new John Stockton? I mean, this is ridiculous. Russell Westbrook knows he's not going to be with this team all year. He's going to be traded. He's going to end up someplace else. So why should he get in the huddle? Now, there are legitimate reasons why he didn't get in the huddle. One is he was talking to some coach on the bench at the time. Maybe he didn't see the huddle. Maybe he was calling Uber Eats. I don't care. <laughs> I have to say this realistically. We are crafting something out of thin air here because we have no idea why Russell Westbrook didn't get in the huddle. But I'm willing to go down this road. But I do have an idea now as to the answer to the question, who does Tony Kornheiser relate to more in this story? And the answer, audience, is Russell Westbrook. I appreciate you yes, empathizing with a man who was being asked to do things beneath his station. But I'll also say this, my word for this reason is groundhoggish, okay? And I say groundhoggish because Russell Westbrook, yes, has seen his shadow. And this is going to be a long winter, man. This is the beginning. Yeah. We know six months of this is coming up. We know exactly what's going to happen with this story, too. We know the news cycle. We can pretend like it's all new and novel, but human behavior, human no. psychology, as you well know, is, is, is pretty easy in some circumstances to suss out. It's a great story. We're just inventing it. We love it.
That's the last word. Let's take one last break. Still to come, have the Braves regained the series edge against the Phillies? And is social media being too tough on my sweet, sweet Ben Simmons? You're a fan of Ben Simmons, right? I am. I just want to make sure. Unironically, yeah. unironically, just probably the big and Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice is the wide receiver, what Jim Brown is to running back, and what Tom Brady is to quarterback. He is the best by a wide margin. Rice was the primary receiver for Joe Montana and Steve Young. All three are in the Hall of Fame. Rice has 22,895 receiving yards. The next guy is Larry Fitzgerald with 17,492. The active leader is Julio Jones, 9,000 behind Rice. <laughs> Rice has 197 touchdown catches. The next guy is Randy Moss with 156. The active leaders are Devontae Adams and Mike Evans, 120 behind Rice. Rice has 1,549 receptions. The next guy is Fitzgerald with 1,432. The active leader is Julio Jones, about 700 behind Rice. No, Tony, the only other plausible name in the conversation about greatest receiver of all time is Randy Moss, and you just gave the statistical gap there. Another big statistical accomplishment, by the way. Jerry Rice has played in four Super Bowls. He has eight touchdowns. No one also is close in that regard either. Clearly, clearly the best to ever do it. No, he's the one. There may not be a two. He's the one. <laughs> Happy anniversary, Jim Thorpe's legacy. On this day 39 years ago, 30 years after his death, the International Olympic Committee restored the two gold medals Jim Thorpe had been stripped of for getting paid to play baseball in a semi-pro league prior to the 1912 Olympics. Thorpe's medals were in the pentathlon and decathlon in the Stockholm Games. Thorpe was such a singular talent that the Associated Press rated him the greatest athlete of the first half of the 20th century. He played six seasons of Major League Baseball, played for six teams in what is now the National Football League. Thorpe was part of the inaugural class of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Pulitzer Prize winning reporter David Marinus recently wrote, Path Hit by Lightning, the life of Jim Thorpe. Hmm. The other note, Tony, about those 1912 Olympics where Jim Thorpe broke out into the national consciousness is that he was not actually even considered an American citizen because he is Native American. That happened only in 1924, I believe. So the idea that this guy without video, without citizenship, had this legend birthed, it does, it, it does behoove us now to remember it as vividly as we can. Happy trails for the Phillies' divisional series lead over the Braves. Atlanta even the series at one last night with a 3-0 win over the Phillies. Kyle Wright, who led the majors with 21 wins, pitched six scoreless innings, allowing just two hits. Atlanta was helped by a pair of wonderful catches, one in fair territory by shortstop Dansby Swanson laying out, and one in foul territory up against the tarp <laughs> by third baseman Austin Riley. This series now shifts to Philadelphia, where Aaron Nola will start for the home team. The Phillies are hoping for some home cooking for the top of their order. Kyle Schwarber is 0 for 16 with eight strikeouts in the playoffs. And Reese Hoskins is 1 for 18 with six strikeouts. And the Phillies themselves, Tony, have not won a playoff game at home since October of 2011. And so I know they have a home field advantage now because they're the underdog. And guess what? They even the series. But there is a lot of tension in Philly these days. So as a Nats fan, I'm conflicted over this because Bryce Harper left Washington to go to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Had he not gone within the division, I wouldn't have really cared. I always liked Bryce Harper, but it's part of me wants to root against Philadelphia, though my son went to school there and loved it. And I've been there a lot <laughs> and liked it as well. This is my own personal conflict. One correction, Wilbon sent this in. If the Bears beat the Commanders tonight, yeah, I've said it, Commanders, <laughs> They will have three wins, not two. Yeah, they're That's going to contend conflict. for the Super yeah. Bowl right away. The Bears, sure. <laughs> Wilbon hates the new coach, Eberflus, like he hated the last coach, Nagy. Let's go to the big finish. Game two between the Guardians and the Yankees has been postponed by rain until tomorrow afternoon. Are you disappointed, Mr. Yankee? I am disappointed because the stadium looked kind of like the old stadium. They were beating up on the Cleveland baseball team and everybody was really enjoying themselves. But Carlos Correa, Tony, he tells El Nuevo Dia that he will opt out of his deal with the Twins. Is that significant? 
Yeah, another free agent shortstop. Dansby Swanson could be one. Trey Turner could be one. Xander Bogarts could be one. All the money's going Aaron Judge anyway. Ben Simmons had seven points, eight rebounds, ten assists against the Bucks last night. You're impressed? I am impressed. Totally underrated the way that he has this skill set that's special, that is minimized. His weaknesses are minimized by the lineup around him. Woj, meanwhile, says the Warriors did not suspend Draymond Green for the opener because they did not want him to miss ring night. Does that make sense? Good for them. It's kindness and it's recognition. They might not have those four rings without Draymond Green. Dolphins captains removed a ping pong table from the <laughs> locker room. Are you all right with that? No, I love ping pong. We're out of time. I do. We'll try and do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Pablo Torre. Please check out ESPN Daily wherever you get the good podcasts and debatable, the online TV show on YouTube, Twitter, and the ESPN app. But for now, we'll hit it back to Sports Center.